The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is with you. Welcome to this time of worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Do you feel it? God's kingdom is beneath our feet. Do you know it? God's reconciling love in Christ has shattered our ways of viewing people. No longer do we label our sisters and brothers. We welcome them with open arms. Do you believe it? God has made everything, including us, new. And sends us forth to share this good news with everyone. Let us pray together. Holy God, word shaper, you are not our accountant, but our loving creator. You are not angry at us, but you forgive us. You are not our enemy, but the one who runs toward us with wide open arms, throwing stakes on the grill. <clears throat> Christ, shaper of our story, you travel to that distant country called our sin to bring us home once again. You share your inheritance with us so we might be blessed. You know the famine of our spirits and fill it with your hope. Holy Spirit, life shaper, surrounded by your grace, we offer glad cries of salvation. Encircled by your constant love, we shout for joy, enclosed in your comforting arms. Nothing can overwhelm us, God and community, holy in one. From now on, we will remember our life in you. Amen. Let us stand and sing hymn number one. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We know our faults, the way we have treated others, our alienation from God, our unwillingness to be faithful people. We will not hide our sin or remain silent, 
but confess them to the one who surrounds us with steadfast love. Please join me as we pray, saying, On this very day, waiting God, we admit all the lengths to which we go so we might avoid you. You offer us that kingdom of joy and wonder, yet we would hide in places where temptation waits. You invite us to feast on your grace and peace, but we stubbornly refuse because you also welcome those we call outsiders. We are quick to see all the mistakes that those around us make, but hope you will ignore our foolish choices. Celebrating God, before we come to our senses, we find you running towards us, sweeping us up in your arms, tears of grace mingling with our cries of confession, a mighty river washing away our sinful ways to restore us to new life. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we find no limitations in your grace, no reservations about your love, feast that overflows with wonder, a place we can finally call home. Amen. God rolls away everything that stands in our way, our past, our sin, our pain, our hesitation, and reshapes us into new people living in the new creation. What wonderful grace. We are forgiven. Broken, we are made whole. Lost, we are brought home. Empty, we are filled with songs of gladness. We rejoice and give thanks to God who has graced us with mercy. Amen. Glory to God. the peace of Christ with one another.
Let us bow our heads in prayer. Awesome God, we thank you for the gift of this beautiful crisp day. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you. God, open up our hearts and our minds. Speak to us through your holy word and transform us into the people that you want us to be. In all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our responsive reading for today may be found on page 1406 in your pew Bibles. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. We are careful not to judge people by what they seem to be, though we once judged Christ in that way. God has done it all. He sent Christ to make peace between himself and us, and he has given us the work of making peace between himself and others. We were sent to speak for Christ, and God is begging you to listen to our message. We speak for Christ and sincerely ask you to make peace with God. Christ never sinned, but God treated him as a sinner, so that Christ could make us acceptable to God. Our gospel lesson for today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 32. I will be reading the New Revised Standard Version. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me! For I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son." 
Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Everyone knows what it is like to lose something. We all have lost something at one time or another. There are websites now that act as a lost and found box. Users can report our items missing and users can report items found. It is a good example of how technology can help people connect in a useful way. These are gateway sites for all of the physical things that can be retrieved and returned to their rightful owners. One article stated that about twice as many objects have been reported lost as have been reported found in the United States. So the site users are losing things at twice the rate they are finding them. Haven't we all had the experience of losing things that we know deep down we will never recover? Depending on the situation, we can feel disappointed, heartbroken, hopeless, or simply discouraged by our own inability to keep up with things. Chances are we all know what it feels like to be lost, too. When we are physically lost, it feels like we are in a distant country, a land far away, a foreign world. In our gospel lesson, the younger son went to a land far away. Certainly, he felt lost. These three lost parables are very familiar to us as Bible readers. Jesus tells these parables in response to the religious leaders complaining about with whom Jesus surrounds himself. The religious leaders thought Jesus hanging out with those on the margins of society or outside of the religion or sinners and tax collectors was wrong. Jesus entertained the lost people of the world, people who were wrong in the eyes of society. When I think of people who are lost both figuratively and literally, they are people who are distant, people who are in a far country. You and I put people who are different from us 
in the far country. But people who are in the far country can be similar to us. Somebody can also do everything right and still wind up in the far country. Somebody can play by all the rules and work hard and still wind up in the far country. In his book, The Prodigal Son, Timothy Keller corrects the notion that this classic parable of the prodigal son is only about the lostness of the younger brother. In fact, as he demonstrates, the parable concludes with the older brother outside the fellowship of his father. Keller says the parable shows that both the older and younger brothers are lost, just in different ways. The hearts of the two brothers were the same. Both sons resented their father's authority and sought ways of getting out from under it. Each one, in other words, rebelled. But one did so by making very poor decisions and the other by trying to be perfect. Both were alienated from the father's heart. Both were lost sons. Here then is Jesus' radical redefinition of what is wrong with us. Nearly everyone defines sin as breaking a list of rules. Jesus, though, shows us that someone who has violated violated virtually nothing on the list of moral behaviors can be every bit as spiritually lost as the most immoral person. Why? Because sin is not just breaking the rules. It is putting yourself in the place of God as Savior, Lord, and Judge, just as each son sought to displace the authority of their father in his own life. We all may have unexpected turns in our life when we end up in that far country. One day, your job's gone. It's cheaper overseas. And there you are in the far country. You can work so hard at marriage, you don't think you have anything else to give And one day your spouse says, there's nothing left. And there you are in the far country. Your children grow up and don't need you like they once did. And there you are out in the far country. Everyone knows at some point in their life what it is like to be underappreciated. To work, work, work and have someone else get the party. Everyone knows what it is like to get hurt. And there you are in the far country. Everyone knows what it feels like to be lost and in the far country. It's a lonely place. It would be hopeless, the inevitability of the far country, if it weren't for the relentlessness of grace. The movie What Dreams May Come, starring Robin Williams, came out in 1988. Robin Williams plays a doctor who was killed in a car accident shortly after the death of his only two children. Williams is reunited with his children in a bright and colorful, heavenly playground. After a while, he realizes that something is wrong with the setting. He realizes that his wife is missing. We come to find out that the wife who grieved terribly after her entire family died had elected to join all of them in death. But instead of joining them in a colorful heavenly playground, she was plunged into a dark and colorless world of terror and fear. Williams was horrified to learn this and wanted to make things right, so he plunges himself into the same place of darkness, terror, and fear. When they meet up, 
Williams reminds his wife to cling to joy and pulls her back into the light, back into the world of color and joy and play. The German theologian Karl Barth said that Jesus is the son who went into the far country for you and for me. Jesus is the one who in the world where no one would give him anything was willing to endure the sin, isolation, and pain of journeying in the far country. When we say in the Apostles' Creed, he descended into hell, we acknowledge the truth of this. The truth of the crucifixion, that Jesus came to pull each of us back from the world of death and fear and terror into the world of color and light and joy. Jesus ventured into the far country to find you and me, to find the lost and bring all of us home. Isn't it a wonderful relief to know that we will never fall into the lost forever category? Isn't it reassuring to know that God will never give up on us? The main message of the prodigal son, the lost coin, and the lost sheep is that it doesn't matter how far we stray from our everlasting creator or how much we squander the gifts God provides. God is always delighted when we come back, when we return. God's unconditional love is waiting for us to return home where God greets us with open arms. God wants to bless us all richly, to keep us safe, to make us strong, to help us be like a shepherd who really cares for his sheep, like a poor widow who really values all her coins, like a prodigal son who wants to come home. God loves you. God is willing to take you into his loving arms whenever you are ready to come to him. If you feel like you have done something wrong in your life and you are not worthy to God, spill your everything on your mind to God and run to God's loving open arms. You will be forgiven. You will be loved. You will be safe. You will be saved. Amen. As we, pray, uh, as we prepare for the ordination and installation service, let us stand and sing the first three verses of Take My Life, hymn 697.
Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are all called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling, to be disciples of Jesus Christ and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to a particular service as deacons, as ruling elders, and as ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us. Through ordination, God provides for acts of care and compassion in the world, for the ordering and governance of the church, and for the preaching of the word and celebration of the sacraments. Representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the session of First Presbyterian Church now ordains Laura Kohler to her ministry as a deacon and installs her to active service in this congregation. Baptism, you were claimed by the love of God, clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ, and anointed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit to share Christ's mission in the world. Now, you are called by God through the voice of the church for a new service and ministry in Jesus' name. In accordance with the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church, you must say, show your commitment to this calling by responding to these questions. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and head of the church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you be governed by your church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Do we, the members of this church, accept Laura Kohler as a deacon? chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we agree to pray for her, to encourage her, to respect her decisions, and to follow as she guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church?
thanks and praise. Throughout the ages and in every place, you have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation by your grace. We are grateful for ancestors in the faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone, for judges and monarchs who ruled in righteousness and peace, for prophets and apostles who spoke your bold words of mercy and truth, for leaders and teachers in every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. Gracious God, pour out your Spirit upon your servant Laura, whom you have called by baptism as your own. Grant her the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Give her a spirit of truthfulness, that she may show the compassion of Christ in the actions of daily living, and rightly take care of people in need. Gracious God, pour your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church, that we may be for you a whole, holy people baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain your church and ministry, ground us in the gospel, secure our hope in Christ, strengthen our service to the outcast, and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our life together, that we may be effective servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Lord, can you stand up? We only have one, uh, one birthday this week. It's Brenda Becklins. Happy birthday to Brenda. Please take note of the visits that I will be doing on Tuesday and Thursday. On Wednesday, we have a Bible study at 7 a.m. that you all are welcome to. You also are welcome to the Lenten prayer service at 12.05 p.m. on Wednesday. Youth club will meet at 3.45. The confirmation class meets at 6. And the four H's meet at 7. Does anyone else have any announcements for today or joys or concerns?
We want to keep Sue Tiffany in our prayers. Sue spent about five days in the hospital last week, and she is now home. Um, please continue to pray for Sue. Any others? If not, let us bow our heads in prayer. Creator God, we come before you with joys and concerns that are written on our hearts and our minds. At this time, we lift all of them up to you. God, we pray for people that are grieving over the loss of a loved one, whether it happened long ago or it happened recently. Surround them with your love and your hope and your peace. God, we pray for healing for all those that are in the hospital at this time. We pray for all those that are sick in our community and in, at the world, in, in the world at large. God, we lift up all of our family members and friends and ask for your blessing upon them. God, I lift up our entire church family and I ask that you bring healing into our lives wherever we may need it, whether it be physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual. God, we lift up people that are serving in our military. We ask that you protect them and keep them safe. Allow them to come back home as soon as their mission is over. God, we pray for all people in society that help take care of us, that help make our part of the world run smoothly. God, we pray for wisdom and guidance for elected leaders at the city level, the county level, the state level, the national level, and worldwide. And God, we pray for people that are discouraged in life at this time. Fill them with hope. God, we pray for those who are lonely. Surround them with love. God, we pray for people fighting addictions. Give them strength. God, we pray for all those that do not know the good news of Jesus Christ. May this be the day that they come into your fold. God, we pray for all of our various occupations, and we ask that you bless them. We pray for all people that are suffering in the world at this time. Please continue to work through us as a church. May we be the answer to someone's prayer. God, we lift up the people of Ukraine and we ask that you bless them. We pray for an end to Russia's aggression. We pray for peace all over the world.
Now let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our worship with this morning's offering. Let us pray together. May we not be like the older brother, grumbling and resentful of your generosity. Rather, with joy and hope, we offer our gifts that others might be swept up in your loving and gracious arms. Amen. Let us turn to hymn number 465 and sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Now receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.